Yeah. Excellent. Can you see the screen? All right, cool. Well, thank you everybody for joining. Um, I am super excited uh, to talk with Joey today. Um, I, as Well, I'll quickly go through just how to ask questions for those of you that have not done a Zoom webinar at this point, which probably means you haven't. Welcome to 2020. For those of you that have never been on Zoom, it's a cool new technology all the kids are using. Welcome. Literally all of the kids are using. A lot of them started just today. Um, so if you need to, you are welcome. We want this to be really interactive. So there's chat there at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to hit chat. You can either send it to all panelists or if you're a little bit more shy and you just want to message something to either Emma or Lauren, um, they'll voice your question, but uh, I'd certainly encourage you to share it there publicly and uh, we'll just kind of make it a part of the conversation. But as we jump in, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Chris Yoko. I'm the founder of Yoko CEO over here. And we work with organizations that have a passion or purpose beyond profit, build a better world through uh, the asset we believe is their greatest tool, which is their web presence. And um, so far, our big goal has been to affect the lives of 100 million people by the end of 2020. And uh, I think we're going to be able to hit it. We are over 90 million people possibly impacted so far. And um, we recently won uh, Best Places to Work, which is fun. And uh, I play hockey recreationally, and I'm dying to go back. Well, I guess I'm literally not dying because I'll not go back to get the COVID, but uh, I am looking forward to getting back to it. That being said, way more excited to introduce Joey. Uh, he is, as you can see here, a world-class human being. He is, uh, uh, I've met Joey through a group called Cadre that we were both fortunate enough to be a part of. And there's that saying that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And Joey is one of those people that I wanted to spend a lot of time with because I could even get like 20% to be the average of what Joey is. I would be very happy with my life. And uh, he is an expert when it comes to many things. But uh, for today's conversation, we're going to be talking about customer experience and uh, what that looks like in the brave new world in which we reside. So um, that being said, I'll go ahead and turn the screen share off just so people can see the videos and we'll dive into it. Welcome aboard, Joy. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chris. I appreciate the uh, kind introduction, and I'm beyond excited for our conversation today. For those of you that don't know, uh, and we'll get into this, but when it came time for me to write my book, and I had been talking about customer experience and thinking about customer experience for decades, I was trying to find some great case studies. And one of the first case studies that I identified that I desperately wanted in my book was to unpack the Yoko Co experience and the amazing experience that Chris creates for his clients. So today is kind of special for me because it's not often that I get to do a conversation with someone who's a case study in my book. So we might get to see the questions going both ways here a little bit because Chris, he's very humble. He also knows a ton about creating remarkable client experiences and employee experiences. So super excited for the conversation today and excited to have so many people. Oh my goodness, David from South Africa, Maddie Christofferson. Oh my gosh, Canadians in the house. It's about to get crazy. We have <laughs> such an international participation today. So wow. love that you're all chiming in on the chat and keep the comments and questions coming. We're excited for them. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, uh, it's funny because you mentioned a lot of the stuff that our case study is based off of in the book. And all of that goes back to, um, oh, thank you, Matt, that's not great. Lauren, we'll wanna look into that. Um, <laughs> uh, as a case study in the book, it goes back to one of our first kind of more formal meetings, which whenever you were doing the, uh, the Remarkable Growth Experience. And you had sat everybody down and we were talking about uh, the way that we all judge ourselves by our intention and we judge others by our actions. And a lot of time our actions aren't in line with our intentions necessarily. And one of the things you've said back then that has stuck with me ever since is uh, if the first thing your client gets from you is an invoice, you're doing something wrong. And I just held my head in my hands. And I was like, oh no, I can't believe we've been doing this because it's definitely not the feeling we ever wanted to have. But sure enough, you know, just because it was a, you know, perfunctory way of doing business, we we're like, all right, cool. That'll come first and we'll keep on going. And what I thought would be an interesting way to start the conversation off today is because so many people have been not only acting, but reacting to all the changes in life going remote. So many things that used to happen in person or in the office or in a conference are now happening remote that everyone's been so focused on just reacting and getting their legs under them that I feel like not a lot of people have had a chance to really check to see if the changes they've made are really in line with the intentions they want for their customer experience. And considering that's a lot of what 
you and Dan lean into on the experience this show, which for those who don't know, that is Joey's podcast uh, with Dan Gringus focused on customer experience. They just launched season six, what, two days ago, I think? Yeah, just came out. So it just came out. And uh, I thought that might be an interesting place to kind of start the conversation is talking a little bit about the ways that we can be, you know, kind of remarkable while remote and maybe even talking a little bit about even some of the exercise you worked through way back then and really kind of marshalling, you know, what platforms are we using and what days are people receiving with touch points and use this as a chance to check in. What do you think? Yeah, no, that sounds fantastic, Chris. Uh, you know, it would not be a conversation in 2020 if a few minutes into the conversation we didn't address <laughs> the uh, elephant in the room, the 800-pound gorilla, the impact that COVID-19 has had on every business in the world. Uh, I don't care whether you're small, medium, or large. I don't care whether you're product or service. I don't care whether you're online or offline. I don't care if you're international or domestic. You've got a power team of one or you've got a team of a thousand plus, the reality is the way you're doing business today, September of 2020, is very different than the way you were doing business at the beginning of this year, even in January of 2020. And I don't think any of us could have anticipated the magnitude of the changes or the impact or the acceleration of the opportunity and the necessity to change to address this new world. All that being said, here's what I know for a fact, Chris. The people who take care of their clients and their customers during the COVID-19 pandemic, and by the way, we're still in the during for the <laughs> keeping score at home, will have clients and customers post-pandemic. And there will come a time that is post-pandemic, but how you treat them now is really going to matter. And I don't think there's ever been a time in human history where there is more opportunity, more possibility, and more necessity to create personal and emotional connection with your customers and to try your best in every interaction to deliver as remarkable of an experience as possible. Absolutely. Well said. And I mean, to that point, is with everyone going through everything that this involves, and obviously it plays in at a lot of different levels. There's the familial, the personal, the stress, all of these things that come into play. And it's worth reminding another you know, lesson we've talked about in the past is that people do bring all of their personal life into their work. And there used to be this you know, rule that was like, oh, people compartmentalize, you know, who they are at work has nothing to do with who they are at home. And like, if nothing else, it's like, well, now people are working at the place where they also are at home. And so these two worlds have never blurred closer together and the Venn diagrams never overlapped more. And so those abilities to kind of really create a true relationship with people that goes beyond just kind of the professional layer and into the more personal and emotional side of things, I think is really appropriate right now when done, I think, with the right mentality. And I think, I mean, I don't know if you've seen examples of this, but I know, especially like around like that March, April time frame, you could really see two different schools of thoughts in your inbox, which was like all the notes from all the CEOs about what their company is doing in response and whether you should be buying something for them or taking care of yourself or whatever the case might look like. And I wasn't sure if you had any examples or thoughts on that specifically. And then, oh my goodness, oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, let, let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And let's start with the ugly. If I had a dollar for every company that sent me a link to the CDC website in the month of March so that I could learn, I mean, at some point, like I understand the intention behind it, but did anybody else feel like there was one PR consultant? that was writing all the emails because they all felt the same. Copy In trying unprecedented times, we want you to know that we're here for you. Let us tell you a little bit about our cleaning protocols that we've adopted and also link to the CDC website so you can clean your house too. Like on one hand, I get it, I understand it. But then counterbalance that against our mutual friend, Steve Weaver, who runs a fantastic company in uh, Ohio called Candle Lab. And the way Candle Lab works is you physically go into the store and you make a candle. You choose the scents that you want and you take home this memento. You light the candle in your house. It makes your house smell good. And it's a custom mix that you made. Well, Steve did this really emotional, connective, personal post on Facebook where he basically said like, hey, this, this isn't fun. This is miserable. I know you're having a hard time, but rest assured, we're all in this together. We're going to be able to get through it. And it wasn't trying to sell more candles. It wasn't trying to get someone to sign up for a newsletter. It wasn't saying, hey, here's a coupon for a future purchase. It was human. It was connective. 
And because I'm friends with Steve, we had the chance to talk. That single post produced more business for his business than any other social media post in the history of their company. <laughs> he wasn't selling anything. He was being human. See, I think we live in this fiction, Chris, that we're either in B2B or we're in B2C. And so many companies, design, you know, oh, well, you don't understand, Joey, we're B2B. Or since I know we got some folks in Washington listening, we even get B2G. That's business to government for those of you keeping score at home. But the reality is we're all in the H to H business, the human to human business. And if COVID-19 has taught us nothing, it's to bring that forward into our consciousness and reality. I mean, how many people are watching this webinar right now from home with kids running around, with kids either on Zoom doing virtual school or they're home because school hasn't started or they're home because their school isn't going to start and you're not even sure what you're going to do for school and you're feeling bad for that. And now you're asked to log into a webinar and learn about creating great customer experiences. The reality is the line, the differential between our personal lives and our professional lives is completely gone. I would posit there never was a line. It was a fictitious line that we logged between nine o'clock in the morning and five o'clock at night, or if you're an entrepreneur and work half days between nine and nine. Uh, you know, it was just like one of these things where we believed that there was a barrier between the two or a wall or a boundary, but there really wasn't. And what I love about the COVID-19 world is that when we look into the camera, when we see the person in their home, we get a different level of connection. You can see that I have some toys behind me. You know, one of my kids may run by, you know, these type of things. We get the human aspect of our reality. And I think the opportunity for every business on the planet right now is to double down on the human connection, to double down on the empathy, to double down on the relationships that we're trying to build independent of selling more product or signing up more services. And instead to say, how can I connect better to that other human that is on the other side of the line or on the other side of this conversation or connected on the other side of the screen? Absolutely. And I think a big Part of it is also one getting people to have that perspective, and I think people who are really H to H minded, they want to build those relationships. They tend to be more people pleasers. Uh, at least that's certainly how I think about myself, and I think a lot of people feel that way. And then there's people that also feel that way, but then they're up against the wall of having some kind of you know, oh, I've got a sales quota or I've got something that I've got to meet, and you got to be able to kind of change that mentality up the line, which is one where a lot of times I point people towards, you know, videos or your book to start to think about like, you alone do not have the power to move the market regardless of what you do. And so now you get an opportunity to either really lean into relationships, which like you said, are gonna persist through this and after this, or you can't. And like at the end of the day, even if a business goes under, like one of the assets you can't foreclose on, you can't shift around in bankruptcy, are those relationships. Like that's the thing that is maintained. So even if I can't convince you it's the right thing to do from like an open heart and pure, just like empathetic face to be like then from a more business minded and a tactically minded place, do it because it's the thing that in the long run is going to be better for you. 100%. I don't care whether you skew left brain and you're all about how do the numbers add up and what's the bottom line or more right brain, which is more like creative and feeling and how does it all connect together? The reality is your network is your net worth and the relationships that you establish, the connections you make, whether it's in this business or in a future business, are the things that are going to serve you long term. I mean, Chris, we've known each other for years. My business has evolved over time. I mean, I've had a crazy eclectic career. A <laughs> lot of insane things have happened. But, you know, you mentioned my podcast early on, you know, the podcast that I co-host with my buddy Dan, the music for our podcast was created by my roommate from law school. Oh, I, I never knew that. So, so stop and think about that. I go to law school, law school, and I've got a roommate. And now fast forward 20 years later, I've got a customer experience podcast and my law school roommate is the musician who created the music for the show. So the reality is we all are multifaceted. We all have unique skill sets and we have a variety of skill sets that we don't necessarily get to bring to bear during our workday. 
But the unique thing about all humans and the beautiful thing about all humans is the more we can connect with those varying distant, different aspects of their personality, the more we will be able to sustain relationships over the decades. And what's awesome is I now am paying my law school roommate, not for his legal advice, although he's a great lawyer and independently fantastic offers great legal services, but I'm paying him to create music for my show which sponsors are paying me to have this show to spread the word about the importance of customer experience. So this stuff all connects and we can say it from that, you know, altruistic of, oh, we're connecting and we're being human and we're creating these, you know, awesome opportunities to do good and be better. And that's wonderful. And transactions are happening as well that are keeping the economy moving. So I don't care which lens you come at it, this stuff works. Yeah, absolutely. It's just being, yeah, whatever it is that convinces you to do what in the long term is ultimately the right thing, it benefits everybody too. Because like you said, it's that kind of continuous cycle where those kind of loops all interplay with thousands of other circles that are just as crazy as that one. And ultimately that's going to benefit, you know, everybody involved. And with that in mind, I mean, thinking about all the chaos that is going on and not to make this a whole COVID specific episode, but I mean, one of the things that I always thought I got some of the greatest value out of and <clears throat> for those of you that aren't familiar with our team joey's creative live course is three days of content and is part of the first two weeks of onboarding for our team members so uh, about 30 percent of our onboarding is just people watching joey talk but it does do a real check-in and what i love is you know the first 100 days exercise and being able to be really intentional about it's a really easy exercise to explain to put yourself in your customer's shoes and kind of even just very quickly in a half an hour and 15 minutes, you're able to kind of check in with yourself and see, hey, how are our actions aligned with our intentions and this ability? And I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Obviously, I don't want to give too much away, but I know it's also a big part of the book. And obviously, Oh, yeah, no, no problem. I'm, I'm all about giving it all away. Anybody who is, who is locked in like, hey, there's this IP that you can only access if you pay for it, welcome to 2020. No, <laughs> it's available to everybody and it's all out there. Yeah, I, I think you bring up an excellent point, Chris, that I think a lot of business owners and employees struggle with, which is this disconnect between our intentions and our actions. I think most people, if you get them in a positive state and in an honest conversation, will tell you that they want to put good out into the world, that they want to help other people, that they want to do good things. But invariably, what stops them is, I'm too busy. Yep. I don't have the budget. My boss won't let me. You don't understand that's not how this industry works. And while those are all legitimate observations to make, the reality is those observations are going to keep you where you're at. And I know very few people on the planet who are thoroughly satisfied where they're at and don't want to have more impact, don't want to grow more, learn more, be more, do more, see more, have more, experience more. And the only way we're going to do that is if we're willing to push up against the traditional way of doing it, you know, push up against the way we're supposed to act and instead just embrace the way that we know internally we should act, but for some reason we've decided to self-censor. And this obviously shows up in some industries more than others, but the way that you can, I think, really look at your business and figure out what's going on is to say, okay, what is the client journey? What actually happens? We have this vision of what happens, and then we have the reality that they experience. And the problem is we struggle to experience what they experience because this is familiar to us. You know, Chris, you've built hundreds of websites, thousands of websites at this point, maybe tens of thousands of websites. <laughs> But for somebody who comes to you guys to build a website or to build a mobile app or to find a technology solution, it may be the first time they've ever done this. And they're coming to the table, total newbie, not knowing what to do, whereas you're saying, oh, this is real simple. Just trust me. We're going to do this and then this and this and this. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with your team. At full disclosure, Chris has built my website and all of my online presence. And even knowing the game, I know that your team spends at least 50% of their time with me doing psychology. Right. <laughs> at least 50% has nothing to do with technology, has nothing to do with the finished product, and has everything to do with managing my own baggage, 
about the content on the site, the functionality of the site, when are we actually going to launch, all these things. And so I think the opportunity here and why we keep coming back to the human condition is to recognize where your customers, where your clients are at, and to meet them there. See, we all have this vision of where we want to take them. We want to take them to the finish line, to the outcome, the new website, you know, buying our product, subscribing to our service, whatever it may be. We have this vision of where we want them to go. But the problem is we have a tendency to run in, grab their hand, and then sprint off in the other direction, dragging <laughs> them behind us. And it's like, let's come into where they're at, meet them where they are, connect, build some empathy see the world from their lens and their perspective, and then invite them to come with us to the place that they said they want to go, but they might need a little more persuasion to actually get their feet moving. Oh, absolutely. And there's that bit of, <clears throat> I don't remember what the name for the psychological effect is, but there's that effect where you forget how long it took you to become as good as you are at the thing that you understand. So even when you try to put yourself in someone else's your shoes, you're like, ah, it doesn't take that long to get up to speed with this. So you feel like you're jogging and they, you know, they're still dragging behind. Totally. Yeah. And, and Chris, here's the thing. I, I liken this to, uh, let, let me do a little experiment here for everybody watching at home. Okay. If I were to ask you to make a list of the 100 things you are best at, and you were doing it in the privacy of your own home with a little sheet of paper so you didn't have to worry that you were bragging or not being humble or whatever it may be. And you were to just start making the list, writing everything down. And you were to write your list down of the hundred things you are best at. And then you were to give me the list and I were to review the list. Do you know what wouldn't be on your list? Breathing. Breathing. Now, here's the interesting thing about breathing. It is the thing you have done the most in your life. <laughs> it is literally the first thing you did when you came into the world. <gasps> you took a breath and you've been doing it every day since, day in and day out without missing a beat. You do it when you're awake, you do it when you're asleep. You do it to a level that most people never even consciously think about the act of breathing. We are pros, we are experts at breathing. <laughs> and yet it wouldn't make your list of the top 100 things. Here's the crazy analogy, though, or the comparison. Your skill set in your industry, your knowledge of your business is like breathing to you. Right. You do it without thinking about it. And when you go to someone else, you don't realize that they don't have your background. They don't have your experience. They don't have your perspective. So you're thinking, oh, this is real easy. Let me walk you through the baby steps. And they're thinking, you just asked me to run a marathon. And what do we need to do? Well, Justin leads it in the chat. He says you need to acclimate those people. Justin, somebody who's familiar with the book and the methodology. <laughs> One of the eight phases in the customer journey and the phase that actually causes the most businesses the greatest amount of difficulty is the acclimate phase. In the acclimate phase, you have to hold your customer's hand. You have to acclimate them to your way of doing business because you know what comes next. They have no idea. And you may think, but Joey, I gave them a proposal. We gave them a contract. We outlined all the phases and they signed it. Friends, a couple thoughts. Number one, you sign things that you don't read all the time. All the time. How many terms and conditions have you read? Yeah. yeah, I mean, first of all, yeah, you never read the terms and conditions. You just scroll, scroll, scroll to the bottom because they finally instituted that functionality that you have to scroll before you can hit I accept. You hit accept. Or you go to the car rental place and they've got that little box. You finally get up there and they're like, click I accept. And you're just like, I accept, I accept. You're like, you know, a hamster ringing the thing because you just want the keys. Give me the keys so I can drive away in my car. Number two, it is often the case that the person who is actually going through your process, who is involved in your project or your service or your product delivery, is not the person who purchased it. They never saw the contract. They never saw the project plan. They're used, they never read the directions. They're now using something that they have zero context for and they have to intuitively figure out. So in the acclimate phase, which is in the middle of the eight phases, we need to stop and hold their hand and acclimate them. And if you do, not only will you have happier clients, you will have happier employees, and you will be able to migrate them through that phase to the next phase, which is the accomplished phase, the finish line that they're all trying to reach. 
and it's so much of that is <clears throat> to the point you made is you take for granted, you know, the fact that you've been breathing in this industry this whole time <clears throat> and then jumping in, you can't have that fresh perspective. And that's why whether you get somebody to be an outside set of eyes, whether it's like a client that you can really trust and say, Hey, can you tell me the things not necessarily that I want to hear, but what I need to hear about our process where we're going too fast, we're going too slow. Um, or as you bring new people onto the team, a lot of times they can be really, you know, we just, uh, you just met Emma as we were starting the, the webinar. She's on day six, I think it is. And one of the things I love most about people that have a fresh perspective is a lot of times in a lot of new places, they're like, I'll stay quiet. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to say anything. And I was like, this is the time, whatever. We want you to speak up the most because after a while, you're just going to think this is the way it's done. And that fresh perspective is gone. And so whenever you think about a chance to get that outside perspective, you may very well have it with people that are on your team and can be that surrogate client, that surrogate customer and give you some of that perspective where they're like, yeah, I don't understand anything that just happened in this meeting. So please, let's think about how we, we do this differently. Oh, Chris, it's such an excellent point. New employees and new customers, new clients are gold. And the reason they're gold is because they don't know why you do the things you do. And if you can encourage them to ask why, one of the things I like to do with new employees is I say, hey, for the first two weeks, at the end of every day, we're going to have a 20-minute call, you and me. And here's how that call is going to work. I want you to bring three why questions to the call. Why do we have a weekly team meeting? Why do I have to spend two weeks in training before I get to actually interact with a customer? Why do we bill our customers on the fifth of the month? And the goal is for them to bring three different why questions to every meeting. Now, here's the secret. Your job is not to answer the question. Your job is to catalog the questions and then say, let me think about that and get back to you. And when you think about it, I want you to think through to the third level minimum of your answer. Okay, the first answer, why do we have team meetings? Because how else am I supposed to keep all these people on the same page? Okay, great. Next level, why do you have these team meetings? Oh, there's an opportunity to get everybody together so we can make sure that everybody knows what our goals are and where we're moving towards. Great, why else do we have these meetings? Oh, well now I have to think about it a little. Because <laughs> I gave you my first quick answers, right? I'm not interested in your quick answers. I'm interested in the answers that are deeper. And what you may find is you get to the point where you realize, I don't know why we have a weekly meeting. We might not need a weekly meeting. Or you might realize, oh my gosh, the weekly meeting is about getting the chance to see each other. And this is why we always require the Zoom cameras to be on. Okay, uh, there's a question, you know, any advice for digital handholding in the COVID era? Well, the reality here is that the things that we were doing in person, we just need to translate to a digital scenario. Imagine walking into a boardroom meeting that you were going to have your regular team meeting and you walk in and somebody's like this. <laughs> and on the thing, it says their name. And they're like this. You'd be like, what are you doing? I can't see your face. What's going on? And yet in a Zoom meeting, we allow people to not have their cameras on. And the reason most people don't want to turn their cameras on is they're embarrassed of the background. They're embarrassed as to what's going on. They haven't cleaned their house. Their kids running around. Some weird stuff's happening, whatever it may be. Folks, embrace the weird. Okay, be like Austin. Just celebrate the weirdness. Let people in because that's what actually creates connection. The challenge I have with these false backgrounds and these fake backgrounds, right. they are more of the same. They are more of pretending that reality isn't reality. Let's just acknowledge the reality of our lives. I was on a call the other day and somebody said to me, Joey, you're either really tall or that's a really small room. Because look, <laughs> like the ceiling's right here. And we got some depth of field here. So you're looking, you're going, wow, he's right up in front of us. What's going on? Yes. My office is in my basement. Yes, this house was built before they believed in having 11 foot tall ceilings in every room of the house, okay? So this is my reality, but let's address it. Let's talk about it. And it's also, I mean, to that point is not hiding it because you mentioned like the fake backgrounds and then there's also like the snap cam add-ons where you can put the filters and stuff. And at a certain point, it's like, if you're using a fake background and a filter, at what point are you even you or should I just be talking to a script where you can just basically have said like yes or no to these things and is there any opportunity to actually you know connect as people whenever we have 
just layer after layer of you know artificial elements in between us exactly exactly just be you you know and i know it sounds trite and i know your parents probably told you when you were growing up you know just be you don't follow the crowd if there's some kid that you know if everybody's going to do something stupid and you stand up and say no let's not do that stupid thing there's at least one other kid who also <laughs> didn't want to do the bad choice you know follow. i mean this is what i tell my boys the reality is we forget that when we get into business we say oh i don't want to speak up and say that just sounds dumb because it was my boss's idea or somebody else on the team. Now, be a good human. Don't just say, that sounds stupid, right? But instead say, you know, I'm curious as to why we're doing that. Ask questions. Why? Why do we do it that way? Is there another alternative? What if we tried this? Sometimes it's better to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Just go ahead and do it. Change it up. Try something unique. Try something different. The reality is, as much as I tried to write my book as a playbook for how to design remarkable customer experiences, there is a very specific reason why there are 46 case studies in the book. 46 different case studies. My publisher was like, Joey, too many case studies left. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, no. I want a bunch of them. Why? because I wanted to do two things. Number one, make it clear that this stuff applied in any business. If you have human beings as customers, trying to create remarkable experiences for them is going to work. It is going to improve your top line and your bottom line, okay? But number two, I wanted to show you that there actually is no singular right way to do it. There are as many different ways to create remarkable experiences as there are customers on the planet right? And there's, in fact, there's even more than that. So the reality is we have this opportunity to try new things, to experiment, to do things. I mean, we never would have thought about coming to a client meeting wearing sweatpants. <laughs> but how many of us right now are wearing sweatpants? I know I am. I'll tri full disclosure, friends. You know, I don't think you can see it. I got sweatpants on today. Why? Because you can't see my legs. So it doesn't matter. Let's just embrace it. Let's just acknowledge the reality. And what I found is that when we do, the connection is that much stronger. The connection is that more real because we're actually all in this together. While we feel like we are alone more in this COVID-19 era than ever before because we're having less human-to-human -human interaction and contact in person, this is actually the first time in human history that the entire planet has dealt with the exact same problem at the exact same time. In every other time in human history, we go back to the influenza epidemic in 1918, it rolled across different countries. Here, everyone on the planet is dealing with this because even if your country is one of the countries that's doing well and infection rates are going down or have almost disappeared, you're seeing the news from the other parts of the world on a daily basis that is stressing you out because you're like, oh, we beat it here, but once it comes back, right? We're all in the same place. And yet, for some reason, we've decided to be more divided than connected at any time. Last piece I'll say, and then I'll jump off this soapbox. I think there was a huge branding error at the beginning of the <laughs> And the branding error was calling it social distancing. We should have called it physical distancing because that's what it is. It's physical distancing. And that's actually the relevant and important part of this conversation. Stay six feet apart from each other. Social distancing, what we're doing right now, is something we need to, you know, we never needed to distance socially. We needed to actually connect even more while we were physically distanced. So huge opportunities. And let me tell you, if this stuff is sounding like, oh, Joey, enough with the hoogie poogie mumbo jumbo hug them all <laughs> approach, I'm telling you, if you start to connect with your customers and just begin the sales call by saying, hey, I know you've got kids. Are you hanging in there with this virtual schooling thing? Or are you hanging in there with sending your kids back to school where now they have to wear masks? Or are you not even sure what to do with your kids? Because I got to tell you, that's where I'm at. You know, you just can create a completely different level of connection and conversation if you're willing to go first. If you're willing to go there and open the door, I promise you, they will come in. A lot of it is absolutely about 
extending that invitation. And what's interesting is based on what you just shared, you kind of changed my mentality around <clears throat> offices in general, which is we talked about the fake background and the filters and all of that stuff. And then you begin to think about a conference room is nothing more than like a fake background and a suit is nothing more than like a filter where you put these levels of like artificiality into, you know, the things that are between, you know, two people. And so being able to use this as an opportunity to knock that down and really not let that become the norm whenever we go, you know, back to, you know, whenever this pandemic wraps up, which as you said, it will wrap up at some point. Who knows if it's going to be months or years uh, in the making, but um, ultimately. But we're not going back to normal because by the way, what was normal wasn't normal. <laughs> Sorry. I hate to be the one that pulls the wizard curtain back and says, look, the emperor has no clothes. This is the reality. What we were doing before we had accepted, but it wasn't normal. It wasn't normal compared to any other point in human history, compared to any of the other interactions we want to have in our lives. What are we doing to just embrace our humanity and be more human? Absolutely. Well, and, um, one, thank you, Mom, because the world does need more love and kindness. And then... Um, I love that Chris's mom is on the webinar. It's so great to have you, Mrs. Yoko. I absolutely love it. Thanks for joining us. She's our biggest fan. We were uh, thinking about doing on Mother's Day. If somebody else likes one of our Facebook posts before my mom gets to it, we will send your mom flowers on behalf of you. Oh my gosh, I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and then Mary, uh, yeah, the anxiety, I mean, especially right now, is absolutely over the top. And I not an expert at anxiety at all, but I have found that based on you know, what, what Joey had shared there, which is showing people they're not in it alone. And it's like, guess what? A lot of us are at our worst. And while, yeah, we want to kind of put up those walls, like that's the time it's hardest to be going at it alone. And going first can make that seem like, okay, it's acceptable to sometimes be what people might consider a bit of a mess because this is a really messy time. And having, I mean, whenever you get to that level of depth and connection with somebody, regardless of you know where that professional career goes i mean there's a personal connection that happens there that's going to last long beyond absolutely you know it's interesting the first story in my book the first case study example is about an experience i had with a dentist and i was actually talking to my dentist the other day and after you know 15 years or over a decade in business that she's been in and i talked to a couple other dentists who've been in the industry for 20 years they have seen something happen since march that they have never seen before in the industry and that is a exponential increase in the number of patients coming in with cracked teeth. And when it first started happening, they were like, what is going on? Why are we, are people just eating rock hard candy at home all night? Well, you know, what are they doing? Why are we seeing all these teeth crack? The reality was from stress, from being asleep at night, grinding their teeth. People who are not teeth grinders are grinding their teeth for the first time because of the subconscious stress that everyone's under. Now I understand some people who are logged in from the webinar at this point are going, oh my gosh, all we were talking about is who we're not talking about customer experience. This is supposed to be a business webinar. Friends, this is business. This is your reality right now. Your customers, your employees are experiencing anxiety and stress levels that they have never experienced in their life. And to Mary's point, they are anxious about sharing that with you. They don't want to tell that with you because what if I tell my employer that I'm having a hard time working from home? Maybe my employer will fire me like the other 30 million Americans who have lost their jobs. Oh, well, if I tell this person on the sales call that I'm a little nervous about trying to hit my quota numbers and make sales and I let them know that my anxiety about this is spilling into, will that impact the sales call? Well, it might, but it might impact it in a way that you're not thinking in the sense that it allows you connection that it allows you to stay like, here's the situation. I know plenty of people who their businesses have gone under since March, but I also know plenty of people who had honest conversations with their customers, with their vendors, with their employees, and they said, look, I can't pay my bill in full, but I can pay 30% this month and maybe 30% next month. Can I get some terms? Can you help me out? Or, hey, I know we had planned to do this big project and we had signed the contract, but we can't do it anymore. How can we unwind this in a reasonable way? I know it's not fun, 
but I also know if we come to it from a place of trying to always do what we can for the relationship and for the customer and for the employee and for the employer, we'll all get through this. We really will. Yeah, and it being an opportunity to not be so focused on the numbers and the financials and all the things that, yes, like are a perfunctory part of our reality, but to allow us to be part of that same community and part of that same tribe and have each other's backs. And like, if nothing else, it's been a good opportunity to kind of circle the wagons and check in with each other and have some of those conversations. Like you said, it's not fun, it's work but it is the kind of work that builds resilience, the kind of work that builds those relationships that end up being the bedrock and the foundation for the things that end up getting rebuilt out of whatever comes out of this. And I do think we'll see more of a renaissance, both creatively and professionally out of this time period is going to be a great incubation chamber for a lot of amazing and incredible things. Um, But people are going to remember if you were the person who was, you know, no, you can't have terms. No, like, F you pay me mentality versus yeah, we're all in this together. If I was in that position, I'd want somebody to be, you know, doing the same for me. Let's find a way to make it work. People totally. are remember, absolutely. And they're going to remember that you went the extra mile. They're going to remember that you did the thing that wasn't exactly in alignment with the execution of the contract, but was the thing you needed to do. Okay. The pandemics are not times for policies. Pandemics are not time for policies. Okay. Pandemics are times to make adjustments to acknowledge the reality and do whatever you can to create that remarkable experience, even if that experience isn't in alignment with the way you've done business in the past. It still may be the best choice to make that kind of a change. And it's also a really good reminder, I think, to know that that is never like a box that is checked. Like you don't say like, all right, great. Like now we've done this and I started my call and everyone's got the script that says like, how you guys doing in virtual school? Crazy, right? Anyway, and like move along. Like it's not a thing to check and it's gonna be something different in another month. And you've got to kind of continue to zig and zag and move forward with it. Not let it get stale or become something that is dry because then you're gonna be like, well, I did what Joey said and I don't understand why it's not working. It's like, the action is not the only thing that matters there. Oh, totally. And, and Chris, you bring an excellent point. Thank you for, uh, for clarifying that. You know, this isn't about uh, asking the question. This is about listening to the answer. This isn't about how you doing with that virtual schooling. Th- that's not the secret to this game. <laughs> it's you asking and then closing your mouth and listening and really connecting to the answer they give. And when you, they give the answer of like, oh, we're hanging in there. And you realize, I don't think they are hanging in there. That you get the chance to go first. You get to say, well, I'm glad you're hanging in there because to be candid, we're, we're kind of struggling here. We're having some issues. We're having some challenges. Like, I don't like the screen time. Everything we've heard is keep your kids off screen. And now you're a bad parent if you send your kids to school. You're a bad parent if you let them stay home and are on the screen. So either way, guess what? Congratulations, <laughs> you're a bad parent. Which by the way, most parents, thought they were totally doing a great job before the pandemic and firing it all. So like, I mean, come on. And now I'm supposed to be a parent full time at home with the kids and be an employee or an employer working full time at home with the kids. Like, how am I supposed to do all of this? Friends, we were living a fiction before. We were living a fiction that they were two separate realities. Goes back to the conversation we were having. Oh, you had your personal life and you had your business life. No, they were always like this. It's just we didn't acknowledge it. Well, now guess what? We all get to acknowledge it and decide what we want to do going forward. It was, uh, one of the things I've always hated is whenever people say, hey, it's just business, it's not personal. And you brought up that line of, you know, this fiction that we live in. And it's like, few things used to be as personal as your profession. That's why there are so many people with the last name Baker, with the last name Smith. <laughs> like, what you used to do used to be your personality. And so to say that that was ever removed was this like brief bit of fiction that I'm hoping we move beyond uh, because there is that opportunity now to lead into the whole person. And what I found has been really kind of incredible is having those conversations around like Zoom school and like, oh, you have kids, like what age are they? Is we've gotten referrals and like introductions to some resources and some people that I would have otherwise never heard about if we hadn't had some of those conversations. They're like, oh, I know a person that can help with that. Like, here's who you should talk to or here they're doing this YouTube series. And, you know, you get these incredible bonuses, basically, just by being a better person. I mean, it's incredible. 
totally. The dividends for this not only pay back for your business, but they pay back for you personally as well. And with that in mind, I mean, thinking about all the chaos that's happening, and obviously it's going to continue, being able to lean into the relationships and really thinking about them with a little bit more intention about what you want to put out into the world um, and doing some of those like active listening or, you know, pausing and listening. I'm thinking about, I don't know if Allison, our mutual friend, Allison Whitmire has ever shared this exercise with you, uh, but it was a really eye-opening one with me, which was, she said, ask somebody a question, let them tell the whole story. And the only thing you're going to write is like a keyword of what they said and an arrow going up or down. And what you'll tend to find is that as people raise their voice, they tend to be a little bit more secure and confident in what they're saying. And as it drops down, it tends to be a sign of, you know, insecurity. She's like, don't blanket it with anything. Do that exercise and then lean in and ask some questions about the areas where you drew the down arrows. And that exercise alone has changed the way I've been able to listen. So if there's nothing else somebody gets out of this personally, but hopefully an ability to do that active listening. It's really hard to pay attention to while still listening to the content someone is sharing. Um, but it gives you an opportunity to think about consciously something that you may have registered at a subconscious level and then moved right past to be able to say, oh, wait, hey, there was a little bit of a pause there. Like, why is there some insecurity? And obviously being able to ask in a more technical manner than just like your voice dropped here. Like, what's wrong with you? Um, but being able to lean in and really use that as a tool to, to pay attention to how somebody is feeling and mirror that back to them. You didn't say that. Uh, in so many words, but you address, you know, being able to kind of mirror that emotion is one of the things that enables people to really feel a connection with somebody. And it also shows somebody, again, that they're not alone in this. You ask Absolutely. the question and you move right back. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Absolutely. No, I was going to say, well, let's, let's bring this specifically into a customer experience context, right? I had a situation the other day where um, I was trying to set up auto billing for health insurance. Okay, I'm the kind of person that likes to have everything set up on auto payment, so I don't have to remember, I don't have to worry about it, just bill it all and let's just keep going, especially for things like health insurance where I have a monthly subscription for it. And long story short, and this is really punctuating what could be a five-hour rant for me, um, my insurance company has two different websites. They have one website where you go to schedule appointments with your doctor, see all your medical records, do, do, do all your stuff. Then they have an entirely different website to pay your bill. Entirely different. Oh, and by the way, you can't connect the two. You can't get from the site over here, over to here for some odd technical reason, right? They can't do that. When I called in to try to sort this and figure out, I will be thoroughly 100% honest. 90% of my desire was to have my frustration heard. 10% was to solve the problem with the auto bill. Right. Like that was there. It was legitimately there. But 90% was just to be heard. And there's an opportunity there. When a client comes to us with a problem or when they come with an issue or there's a complaint, a significant percentage of the time, the great majority of the time, they just want to feel like they were heard. They just want to feel like they were heard. And I don't know about you, Chris, but in this COVID era, and in just independent of COVID, think pre-COVID, in 2020, there are a lot of people walking around that didn't feel they had a voice. They didn't feel they were heard. They didn't feel they were listened to in their own house, let alone at work, let alone in society at large. And I think that's actually what we're seeing here. We're seeing it in the protest. We're seeing it in the comments on social media. People are dying to be heard. And what are they doing? Well, they're doing what most humans do. At least we can see this by looking at children. I know you've got little kids, Chris. I've got little kids. When you take a three-year-old or a second, a two-year-old and they don't feel they're being heard, what do they do? Talk louder. That's all they do. All they know to do is to talk louder. And the reality is so many of the people we deal with, whether they're our customers or our employees, are talking louder and we're still not hearing. Something to think about. Absolutely. And thinking about ways to incorporate that listening. I mean, those are some of the things that you can do. And maybe with the last few minutes we have, we can just give a couple like quick tips and takeaways. People can borrow, steal, whatever, make their own. Um, but I think one of the quickest ones is with that active listening, you can build a sense of community. People just complain, and I think that's what 
social media, we've conditioned people to be like, hey, if you complain in a public forum, you get things addressed. Um, but I think you have an opportunity to really build a community with people whenever you listen, and then you let them know, hey, really sorry this happened to you. Obviously, my time machine is broken. I can't fix it for you, but here's what we're going to do to make sure other people don't have this issue. And that's been, I mean, even for us, like one of the things that has helped shape our process more than anything else has been at the end of any project, as you know, we'll do a project recap meeting. What went well, what went poorly, with the understanding that this is not a finger pointing time. It is a time to tell each other frank and kind of like Kim Scott minded radical feedback to make us each better at the thing that we do. And if you can manage expectations and really set it to be, I'm listening to you to make this better, not only for you, but for anyone who has that issue, it's gonna give you advice that again, if you can act on it and do something with it, is gonna benefit you in the short term and the long term. Absolutely. Chris, can I do a speed round and give some folks, since they've been so kind to be on the call, give them some real tactical stuff they can implement? Because I think we've talked big, per big picture. Let me give you three things that I think any business, regardless of the industry you're in, and regardless of whether you're thinking about your customers or your employees, three things you can do this week, this week, to dramatically move the dial. And that is, let them know they're seen, let them know they're heard, let them know they matter. Let's break each one down. Let them know they're seen. Go on your client or your employee's uh, social media pages, whether that's Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or wherever the kids are hanging out these days, and comment on a post of theirs. Just comment on a post and acknowledge that they have been seen. You exist. You exist, and I see you. Number two, let them know that they've been heard. Instead of doing it publicly, posting on Facebook, send someone a voice message. Send someone a voice memo. Shoot them a little handheld selfie video and send it to them saying, hey, I just wanted you to know uh, that I saw this post or I remember you saying this or whatever, and boy, it really had an impact on me. Let them know that they've been heard. Last but not least, let them know that they matter. We're now to the point where we've come to realize that it doesn't appear that there is any proof that COVID travels through the mail. I know in the first few months, we were all disinfecting our groceries and worried about contactless delivery and all that, and we still should keep our distance, but the reality is we now know that there really aren't any reported cases of somebody getting them in the mail. So here's a huge opportunity for you. Your people are at home. They're actually checking the mailbox for the first time in years because they're there all day and they want to get up from their desk and do something. Give them something to check. Write them a note that lets them know they matter. Here's how it works. Dear Chris, I know it's been a while since we talked, but I just wanted you to know how much I appreciate having you in my life. I blah, 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 and fill in like two or three specific things. I'm so excited to reconnect on the other side of this COVID craziness and sign your name. Here's the thing, I'd ask everybody to think at home. Have you received a handwritten thank you note in the last year? So think about the last year. Have you received a handwritten thank you note? Now I know statistically, because I ask almost every audience this question, the majority of hands are going up right now. Yeah, I've, I've gotten a handwritten thank you note, awesome. So keep your hand in the air if you've got a handwritten thank you note in the last year. Now I want you to still keep your hand up if you still have that note. Now I can't see you, but the reality is your hands are up. Your hands are still up. Why? You read the note. <laughs> you know who it was from. You know what it said. You didn't go back and reread it 10 times, or maybe you did, but you kept the note. Why did you keep it? Because it was proof that you mattered. It was proof that someone took the time to take a pen, to take paper, and in longhand write out a message and mail it to you. Go to the trouble of getting a stamp, having it go through the post, work its way to you to create a physical artifact of the impact you've had in the world on another human being. Let them know that they're seen. Let them know that they're heard. Let them know that they matter. If you do that with your customers and your employees, and your colleagues, and your family members, and your coworkers, and your mentors, and your mentees, and all the different people in your life, you're gonna be just fine. Absolutely. And for those of you considering it, I know, um, especially with the personal gifts or the personal mail, 
we've talked to some people about that as well. And they've been like, well, we don't have their address. People will be more than happy to give you their address. You can ask for a email. We just updated our onboarding surveys to basically say, hey, if you're working from home and you'd like to receive a goodie now and again, give us your home address. If you don't want to share it, totally fine. Give people the opportunity. They will more than likely take you up on it. Absolutely. Um, Should we get to Justin's question real quick? But I know we're running short on time, yeah. but I saw Justin came in and he asked any advice on the most effective way to extract client wins from existing clientele. Justin, I'm not 100% sure what you mean by this, but I'm going to take a guess. And if I get it wrong, jump in with the chat and clarify. I'm guessing you're talking about getting client wins or testimonials or feedback that you can then use to market to other folks. Here's my favorite thing to do. Perfect. Thanks, Justin. Appreciate you jumping in on that. Here's my favorite thing to do when talking to clients. I like to ask them three questions. First question, what have we done that worked well, that you enjoyed, that you liked, et cetera, et cetera? Give me three things. And they list out their three. And that's going to be pretty easy for them. Then you say, my next question, I call this the countdown. The next question, give me two things that we did that you wish we wouldn't have done. Two things you didn't like, or two things that we didn't do that you wish we would have. Now you're going to get some honest feedback because you let them sandwich it. You let them open with a positive. <laughs> They're now, even the people who are glass half full kind of folks are going to be willing to share one or two things. And by asking for two, you get hyper specific, and this will allow you to hone in on the parts of your client journey or your customer experience that aren't as good as they could be. But here's the win. Here's the, here's the answer to your question, Justin. He said, and I have one more question. What is something that happened as the result of our work together, whether to your business or to you personally, that you'll remember a decade from now? Now, what that does is it sets a different standard on their answer. If I've said, what will you remember a decade from now? they're gonna remember the things that had the biggest impact. Now, these may not be the things that you think are gonna create the biggest impact in a testimonial. But I would encourage you to listen to their answer and to realize that nine times out of 10, the biggest client win is something that has nothing to do with your service offering. We got the website built and launched on budget and on time. That was the win. I didn't have to go back to my boss and ask for more money. That was the win. I was able to not have to worry about this project because you kept it moving forward so I could work on the 38 other fires I was putting out. It was a win. You know, you were gracious when we were supposed to have that meeting and I had to reschedule at the last minute because my kids were melting down and you didn't charge me for it and you didn't hold me against, it against me and you were kind and you were gentle with me. That was my win. See, if we open the door for people to actually explain what they will remember, those things are gold when it comes to explaining to other people what the experience of working with you is like. Because let's be candid, we've all got the testimonials. We've all got the testimonials that say, oh my gosh, they built the best website ever. Oh my gosh, this is the most amazing real estate agent I ever dealt with. Oh my gosh, the audience loved his presentation. Whatever it is, we've got those. What we don't have is the testimonials that say, boy, I don't think I ever felt more like a human than when connecting with them. I don't think I ever felt more seen, more heard, more appreciated than working on this project. That's how you build a sustainable business. That's how you build a business where your customers become your raving fans, singing your praises far and wide, your advocates who are out spreading the good news about you. Friends, if you do this stuff right, if you focus on client experience and you focus on employee experience and making all of those touch points and all those interactions as remarkable as possible, you will never spend another dollar on marketing again. <laughs> You will never have to go into a sales meeting going, God, I hope we close them. We really need this one. Because you will have so much abundance. You will have so much possibility. You will have so many opportunities. They will be beating down your door. Just make the investments in your people, and those investments will pay dividends back. Absolutely. And Justin, a nice, easy thing you can do to tag onto that is 
depending on the conversation you're having it with, everyone's doing everything via Zoom. If you had stuff where you need to have it public or you want to memorialize it and show it to other team members, just ask them if it's okay to record the conversation. And then you get to share not secondhand what that conversation looked like, but firsthand, like this is the impact we had on somebody. And that's the stuff that I think for the folks you want on your team really likes people up. Totally. Awesome. All right. Well, I know we're a little bit over time. If anyone has a last question, they're welcome to throw it in. But uh, with that being said, I'll go ahead and pull up the screen share just so. For those of you who may not know where to find either of us, uh, you can find Joey at Joey Coleman or us over at YokoCO at YokoCO.com. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out to us online, drop us a line uh, if you need any help or if you want to follow up. If you're registered here, obviously we'll be sending you a link to the recording so you'll get access to everything we've talked about today. And um, if you'd like, we do these webinars every now and again. It's just a chance for me to basically help share the information from the people that have most influenced my journey and uh, the wisdom I think I would most like to share with people. So feel free to uh, check us out at webinars or email events at YokoCO if you'd like a heads up um, for the next one and we'll give you a heads up. But until then, We'll see you next time. And Joey, thank you so much.